Primal myth and modern delusion joined in their assumption that mankind is only one, perhaps the least, of the highly evolved and dominant races of this planet's long and largely unknown career. Things of inconceivable shape, they implied, had reared towers to the sky and delved into every secret of nature before the first amphibian forebear of man had crawled out of the hot sea 300 million years ago. Some had come down from the stars, a few were as old as the cosmos itself, others had arisen swiftly from terrene germs as far behind the first germs of our life cycle as those germs are behind ourselves. Spans of thousands of millions of years, and linkages with other galaxies and universes, were freely spoken of. Indeed, there was no such thing as time in its humanly accepted sense. But most of the tales and impressions concerned a relatively late race, of a queer and intricate shape resembling no life form known to science, which had lived till only 50 million years before the advent of man. This, they indicated, was the greatest race of all, because it alone had conquered the secret of time. It had learned all things that ever were known, or ever would be known on the Earth, through the power of its keener minds to project themselves into the past and future, even through gulfs of millions of years, and study the lore of every age. From the accomplishments of this race arose all legends of prophets, including those in human mythology. In its vast libraries were volumes of texts and pictures holding the whole of Earth's annals. Histories and descriptions of every species that had ever been or that ever would be, with full records of their arts, their achievements, their languages, and their psychologies. With this eon-embracing knowledge, the great race chose from every era and life form such thoughts, arts, and processes as might suit its own nature and situation. Knowledge of the past, secured through a kind of mind casting outside the recognized senses, was harder to glean than knowledge of the future. In the latter case, the course was easier and more material. With suitable mechanical aid, a mind would project itself forward in time, feeling its dim, extrasensory way till it approached the desired period. Then, after preliminary trials, it would seize on the best discoverable representative of the highest of that period's life forms, entering the organism's brain and setting up therein its own vibrations, while the displaced mind would strike back to the period of the displacer, remaining in the latter's body till a reverse process was set up. The projected mind, in the body of the organism of the future, would then pose as a member of the race whose outward form it wore. Learning as quickly as possible all that could be learned of the chosen age and its massed information and techniques. Meanwhile, the displaced mind, thrown back to the displacer's age and body, would be carefully guarded. It would be kept from harming the body it occupied, and would be drained of all its knowledge by trained questioners. Often it could be questioned in its own language, when previous quests into the future had brought back records of that language. If the mind came from a body whose language the great race could not physically reproduce, clever machines would be made, on which the alien speech could be played as on a musical instrument. The great race's members were immense rugose cones ten feet high, and with head and other organs attached to foot-thick, distensible limbs spreading from the apexes. They spoke by the clicking or scraping of huge paws or claws attached to the end of two of their four limbs, and walked by the expansion and contraction of a viscous layer attached to their vast ten-foot bases. Now and then certain captives were permitted to meet other captive minds seized from the future, to exchange thoughts with consciousnesses living a hundred or a thousand or a million years before or after their own ages. 
and all were urged to write copiously in their own languages of themselves in their respective periods, such documents to be filed in the great central archives. As for the ordinary cases of exploration, when the displacing mind had learned what it wished in the future, it would build an apparatus like that which had started its flight and reverse the process of projection. Once more it would be in its own body in its own age, while the lately captive mind would return to that body of the future to which it properly belonged. When a captive mind of alien origin was returned to its own body in the future, it was purged by an intricate mechanical hypnosis of all it had learned in the great race's age. This because of certain troublesome consequences inherent in the general carrying forward of knowledge in large quantities. The few existing instances of clear transmission had caused, and would cause at known future times, great disasters. And it was largely in consequence of two cases of the kind, said the old myths, that mankind had learned what it had concerning the great race. Of all things surviving physically and directly from that eon distant world, there remained only certain ruins of great stones in far places and under the sea, and parts of the text of the frightful narcotic manuscripts. Thus the returning mind reached its own age with only the faintest and most fragmentary visions of what it had undergone since its seizure. All memories that could be eradicated were eradicated, so that in most cases only a dream-shadowed blank stretched back to the time of the first exchange. Some minds recalled more than others, and the chance joining of memories had at rare times brought hints of the forbidden past to future ages. There probably never was a time when groups or cults did not secretly cherish certain of these hints. In the Necronomicon, the presence of such a cult among human beings was suggested. A cult that sometimes gave aid to minds voyaging down the eons from the days of the great race. And meanwhile the great race itself waxed well nigh omniscient, and turned to the task of setting up exchanges with the minds of other planets, and of exploring their pasts and futures. It sought likewise to fathom the past years and origin of that black, eon-dead orb in far space whence its own mental heritage had come. For the mind of the great race was older than its bodily form. The beings of a dying elder world, wise with the ultimate secrets, had looked ahead for a new world and species wherein they might have long life, and had sent their minds en masse into that future race best adapted to house them the cone-shaped things that peopled our Earth a billion years ago. Thus the great race came to be, while the myriad minds sent backward were left to die in the horror of strange shapes. Later the race would again face death, yet would live through another forward migration of its best minds into the bodies of others who had a longer physical span ahead of them, 